has held the oceans in his hands, who has numbered every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice, all creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord, who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold. Welcome again to this video Bible study of the book of Daniel. Our study has brought us to the last of Daniel's visions, which we are calling the vision of the exalted men. The vision is three chapters long, and it's filled with opaque references to kings, kingdoms, and wars. Our task is to compare those references with the known history of the time and see if we can get some kind of understanding of what the exalted man was prophesying to Daniel. In our previous lesson, we saw how the vision forecast the trials and tribulations of the Jews while they were subject to the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt. In this one, we'll learn how the tide would eventually turn, leaving the Jewish people under the firm control of the Seleucid Empire. We left off in the last lesson with the Egyptian armies of Ptolemy IV winning a major battle over the numerically superior Seleucid forces of Antiochus the Great in the Battle of Raphia. However, as we saw in verse 12, the exalted man prophesied that Ptolemy may have won the battle, but he would lose the war. A major turning point in the conflict between Egypt and Syria came with the renewed aggression of Antiochus the Great against Egypt and the Ptolemaic dynasty as depicted in verses 13 through 16. What is prophesied there? For the king of the north will again raise a greater multitude than the former, and after an interval of some years he will press on with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times, many will rise up against the king of the south. The violent ones among your people will also lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they will fall down. Then the king of the north will come, cast a huge siege ramp, and capture a well-fortified city. And the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even their choicest troops, for there will be no strength to make a stand. But he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. How did all of this play out? Well, the interval of years referred to in verse 13 turned out to be a little over 15 years. Antiochus failed first campaign against Egypt took place in 219, 218 BC. The second one, which is the subject of this reading, began in 202 BC. And in very short order, a huge Syrian army pushed through Phoenicia and Judea all the way down to Gaza, which is about 30 miles north of Raphia. Gaza fell in 201 BC. Verse 14 alludes to the ill-advised support given to the Syrian invaders by an anti-Egyptian party among the Jews. After the fall of Gaza, the Egyptian army managed to regroup and launch a counter-offensive under the command of a powerful general named Scopas. Early on, Scopas met with great success 
And it looked like Antiochus's second Egyptian-Syrian war was going to end as badly as the first one. All of Judea was retaken by the Egyptians, and Scopus entered Jerusalem and executed the leaders of the anti-Egyptian rebels. And thus the prophecy was fulfilled. The violent ones among your people will also lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they will fall down. And sure enough, the tide of the war soon turned again. The Syrians dealt the Egyptians a severe defeat in the Battle of Panium, which is New Testament Caesarea Philippi, in about 200 BC. Scopus ordered a retreat to the fortress city of Sidon on the Phoenician coast, and this set the stage for what we read in verse 15. Then the king of the north will come out and cast up a siege ramp and capture a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground, not even their choicest troops, for there will be no strength to make a stand. When Scopus finally surrendered to Antiochus at Sidon, dominion over southern Syria, Phoenicia, and Judea reverted permanently to the Seleucid Empire, as verse 16 predicts. But he who comes against him, and that is Antiochus coming against Scopus, he will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land with destruction in his hand. At this point, Antiochus did indeed possess the power to destroy the Jews. In actual fact, however, he took action only against the Egyptian sympathizers among them. The rest he treated with remarkable kindness and tolerance. The Ptolemaic Empire never recovered from his defeat at Pania, and it ceased to be a major player in the politics of the Eastern Mediterranean. It was during the reign of Antiochus the Great, however, that the Seleucid Empire first came in to serious conflict with the growing menace of the Roman Republic, which by this time had already subjugated the former Alexandrian territories on the Greek mainland and in Western Asia Minor. Verses 17 through 19, what was prophesied? He will set his face to come with the power of his whole kingdom, bringing with him a proposal of peace, which he will put into effect. He will also give him the daughter of women to ruin it, but she will not take a stand for him or be on his side. Then he will turn his face to the coastlands and capture many, but a commander will put a stop to his scorn against him. Moreover, he will repay him for his scorn. So he will turn his face toward the fortresses of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and be found no more. What are we talking about here, and how did it happen? Well, in 197 BC, eager to avoid a two-front war with Rome on one side and Egypt on the other, Antiochus took advantage of his victory at Sidon by imposing a peace treaty on Egypt whereby his daughter, Cleopatra, and now this is not the famous one, this is an earlier one. His daughter, Cleopatra, was married to Ptolemy V Epiphanes of Egypt. Now, Antiochus's motive in this arrangement was clear enough. Through his daughter, he intended to manipulate Ptolemy Epiphanes, who was no more than 10 years old at the time, into establishing a strongly pro-Seleucid policy in Egypt, essentially making Egypt a puppet state of the Seleucid Empire. As it turned out, the plan failed because the strong-willed Cleopatra gave her allegiance to the nation over which her father had made her the queen. And all this was remarkably prophesied by the exalted men in verse 17. He will set his face to come with the power of his whole kingdom, bringing with him a proposal of peace, which he will put into effect. He will also give him the daughter of women to ruin it, but she will not take a stand for him 
or be on his side. Those arranged political marriages always seem to backfire for both the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Nevertheless, believing that he had secured his southern frontier, Antiochus attempted a show of force against Rome, launching successive campaigns against Roman possessions in the Aegean Sea between Asia Minor and the Greek homeland. He proved to be no match for the Roman military machine, however, losing decisive battles at Thermopylae in 191 and Magnesia in 190 BC. And again, all of this was predicted by the exalted man in verse 18. Then he will turn his face to the coastlands and capture many, but a commander will put a stop to his scorn against him. Moreover, he will repay him for his scorn. Antiochus was repaid for his scorn in the severe peace terms dictated by the Romans. He had to surrender all of his territorial gains in Europe and Asia Minor, as far as the Taurus Mountains in the southeastern corner of the Asia Minor Peninsula. He surrendered his navy, his elephant brigade, and 20 selected hostages, including his grandson, Demetrius, and his own son, who would later be known as Antiochus IV. And finally, he was assessed a huge monetary indemnity to be paid out over a number of years. And it was this monetary indemnity that would ultimately prove to be Antiochus's downfall. Because unable to make the required payments out of his own depleted treasury, he resorted to pillaging the Temple of Bel in Elamaeus, which was a vassal state on the Persian Gulf. And local outrage at the desecration of their temple resulted in a rebellion in which Antiochus was killed in 187 BC. And so the exalted man finished his amazingly accurate prophecy of the life and career of Antiochus the Great in verse 19. So he will turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and be found no more. Verse 20 is sufficient to cover the relatively insignificant reign of Antiochus's oldest living son and successor, Seleucus IV Philopater, who reigned from 187 to 175 BC. What was prophesied about him? Verse 20. Then in his place one will arise who will send an oppressor through the jewel of his kingdom. Yet within a few days he will be shattered, though not in anger nor in battle. How did that happen? Well, Philopater's main preoccupation as king was taxing his citizens to pay the indemnity demanded by Rome. And ironically, he was assassinated by his chief tax collector, Heliodorus, in 175 BC. Ancient historical sources do not record a motive for this act. The vision simply tells us that it was not in anger nor in battle. Well, the reign of the notorious Antiochus IV Epiphanes, which lasted from 175 to 164 BC is capsulized in verses 21 through 45. We've seen Antiochus before. He previously appeared as the small horn who suspended the worship of God in the Jerusalem temple in the vision of the ram and the goat in chapter 8. Here in verse 21 he is introduced as a despicable person who will gain the crown illegitimately. How was that prophesied? Verse 21. In his place, a despicable person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred, but he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. How did it happen? At the time of his father's death, Antiochus IV was still a hostage in Rome. 
But since he was now no longer the son of a living king, and thus not the legal heir to the throne, his value as a hostage was discounted, and he was allowed to return home. The young son of Seleucus IV, Demetrius, who was also a hostage in Rome, was legally next in line for the throne, and he was not released. So in the absence of the legitimate monarch, it was decided to put his uncle, Antiochus, the second son of Antiochus the Great, in charge of the government as prince regent. But Antiochus was determined to set aside his nephew's claim altogether. Even though Demetrius was by now in his 20s and quite competent to rule. So Antiochus curried favor with the governmental leaders with promises of promotion and large favors in return for their support for his proclamation as king. In this way, he managed to secure approval for his illegal accession to the throne as the exalted men prophesied. He will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Antiochus IV's reign was characterized by two great passions. One was the complete and final conquest of the Ptolemaic regime in Egypt. The other was the incorporation of all his subjects, including the Jews, into a monolithic Hellenistic religion and society. The second aim created great civil unrest among the Jews, pitting those who favored a new enlightened Hellenistic society against those who strongly resisted it. What was prophesied? Verses 22 through 28. The overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered, and also the prince of the covenant. After an alliance is made with him, he will practice deception, and he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. In a time of tranquility, he will enter the richest parts of the realm, and he will accomplish what his fathers never did, nor his ancestors. He will distribute plunder, booty, and possessions among them, and he will devise his schemes among the strongholds, but only for a time. He will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south with a large army. So the king of the south will mobilize an extremely large and mighty army for war. But he will not stand, for schemes will be devised against him. Those who eat his choice food will destroy him, and his army will overflow, but many will fall down slain. As for both kings... Their hearts will be intent on evil, and they will speak lies to each other at the same table. But it will not succeed, for the end is still to come at the appointed time. Then he will return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant, and he will take action and then return to his own land. How did it happen? It was Epiphany's policy to throw his intended victims off guard by offering them his friendship and alliance. Then he would move her for an advantageous position till he could catch them by surprise. And so it was with Ptolemy the sixth Philometer, who had ascended to the Egyptian throne in 181 BC at the age of six. Through a series of shrewd military and political maneuvers, Antiochus Epiphanes was able to exercise a powerful influence over this young king and gain a virtual free hand in Egypt. The Prince of the Covenant, in verse 25, is probably a reference to Ptolemy VI, although some believe it refers to the Jewish high priest, Jason, who, in return for a lucrative bribe, Antiochus had deposed and replaced with another pro-Hellenist named Menelaus. Pressing his advantage, Antiochus IV launched incursions into Egypt every year from 171 through 168 BC. 
The campaign of 170 succeeded in subjugating all of Egypt except Alexandria itself. On his way back to Antioch at the end of the campaign, he turned aside to Jerusalem to severely punish those Jews who resisted his Hellenizing policies. A three-day reign of terror left much of the city burned and looted and hundreds of Jews either dead or enslaved. And so this Egyptian campaign and the bloody side trip to Jerusalem were the fulfillment of the prophecies in verses 25 through 28. He will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south with a large army. So the king of the south will mobilize an extremely large and mighty army for war, but he will not stand for schemes will be devised against him. Then he will return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant and he will take action and then return to his own land. Epiphanes launched his final foray into Egypt in 168 BC. He moved against the last Ptolemaic stronghold, the capital of Alexandria, and it appeared that the city would fall. At that point, however, things took a historic turn for the worse for Antiochus and the Seleucid Empire. Verses 29 through 31. What was prophesied? At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south. But this last time, it will not turn out the way it did before. For ships of Kittim will come against him. Therefore, he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. How did it happen? Just as it seemed that Antiochus's dream of total conquest of the Ptolemaic Empire was within his grasp, a Roman fleet was dispatched from Kittim, that is Cyprus, and a Roman ambassador arrived on the scene. Rome presented Antiochus an ultimatum. Either withdraw his forces from Egypt entirely and go home, or Rome would declare war against the Seleucid Empire. And knowing that he was no match for the Roman military machine, Antiochus had no choice but to concede defeat and withdraw. Enraged and on the verge of complete insanity, he determined to vent his spleen by wiping out the Jewish religion and culture once and for all. In 167 BC, he issued an edict declaring the observance of the Jewish religion, the possession and circulation of Jewish sacred literature, and the practice of circumcision to be capital crimes. And with the help of and cooperation of the pro-Hellenist faction among the Jews, he set up Greek altars all over Judea and demanded that the people offer sacrifices to Greek deities on them. He personally desecrated the Jerusalem temple by sacrificing a pig to Zeus, not on the bronze altar of burnt offering in the outer court, but on the golden incense altar within the sanctuary. And if that were not enough, he poured pig broth all over the temple and its sacred objects. All of this is described as the abomination of desolation in verse 31. Well, the result of Antiochus's atrocities in the Jewish temple was insurrection and civil war in Judea. Verses 32 to 35, what was prophesied? By smooth words, he will turn to godlessness, those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by the sword and by the flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. 
Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join with them in hypocrisy. How did it happen? Antiochus was a master in manipulating the Jewish leaders who were divided in their loyalties, winning them over to his cause by glowing promises of preferment and reward. And a considerable number of influential leaders in Jerusalem society and politics were convinced of the expediency of a pro-Hellenic policy. These were those who act wickedly towards the covenant. But these were opposed by a party of Judaic conservatives who dared to risk their lives rather than betray their heritage and their covenant. They fulfilled the prophecy of verse 32. The people who know their God will display strength and take action. These who have insight among the people engaged in a ministry of propaganda, as it were, among their own countrymen, calling them to covenant faithfulness and resistance to the pro-Hellenist movement. The Judaic party endured great hardship and suffering for their faith, with many of them losing their lives and property as Antiochus's forces turned their swords against them and burned their fields and cities. This is alluded to in verse 33. They will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. In the same year as Antiochus's edict, 167 BC, the standard of revolt was raised by Mattathias, a priest in the village of Modin. After killing the officer of Antiochus who had come to enforce the new decree concerning idolatrous worship, Mattathias and his five sons led a guerrilla band that fled to the hills and attracted sympathetic adherents from other cities in Judea. A large number of these original rebels died in their first engagement with the Seleucid forces because they were attacked on the Sabbath and they refused to fight in their own defense. But after this tragic slaughter, they revised their policy and decided they would fight even on the Sabbath if compelled to do so. And they went so far as to engage in violent attacks on Hellenistic Jews who had submitted to Antiochus's ordinance and forsaken the covenant. Not long afterward, Mattathias died, entrusting the leadership of the rebellion to his sons. Judas Maccabeus, Mattathias's third oldest son, assumed the military command. Maccabeus, or Maccabee, means the hammer. And it was originally a nickname for Judas, but it came to be applied to the entire family. In very short order, relying primarily on guerrilla attacks, Judas gained a series of brilliant victories over far larger Seleucid forces. The Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, commemorates the restoration of Jewish worship at the temple in Jerusalem in 164 BC, after Judas removed all the statues depicting Greek gods and goddesses and purified it. The rebellion spurred Antiochus to change his Jewish policy from one of assimilation to one of complete extermination. But, blessedly, before he was able to implement this policy, he was killed in battle in Parthia in 161 BC. Verse 34 speaks in very general terms of the initial defeats and the subsequent victories achieved by the Maccabean rebels. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join them in hypocrisy. Presumably, the little help refers to the relatively small numbers of compatriots who joined the Maccabean troops after the early successes of the original guerrilla band. And then, because one Seleucid army after another fell before their onslaught, 
the Maccabean forces were able to intimidate many of their fellow citizens who had previously held back from the conflict. When Judas's forces began to round up and put to death the pro-Hellenists who had collaborated with the Seleucids, large numbers of less than sincere followers attached themselves to the rebel cause, hoping to save their own skins. As the exalted man had prophesied, many will join with them in hypocrisy. The account of the Maccabean uprising concludes in verse 35 with a strong emphasis on the spiritual significance of this heroic struggle for those who risk their lives for the survival of the commonwealth of Israel. What was prophesied? Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time because it is still to come at the appointed time. How did it happen? All five of the sons of Mattathias died in the conflict with the Seleucid rulers and their Hellenistic Jewish collaborators. John, the oldest, was killed in about 160 BC by Nabataean Arabs, who he thought were his allies. The second, Jonathan, who would succeed his younger brother Judas as a commanding general of the rebel forces, was treacherously captured and murdered by a Seleucid general in 143 BC during what was supposed to be a conference under a flag of truce. Judas Maccabeus himself, the third son, fell in battle in 161 BC, choosing death rather than saving his own life through a strategic retreat. The fourth, Eleazar, was also killed in battle a year earlier than Judas in 162 BC. The youngest son of Mattathias, Simon, took up the banner of leadership of the Maccabean Rebellion in 142 BC, following the murder of Jonathan. Under his leadership, the Jewish rebels won a series of battles that left the Seleucid forces in such disarray that they were forced to retreat to Antioch, leaving the Jews virtually independent. Simon became the first prince of the Hebrew Hasmonean dynasty, named for Asmonius, the great-grandfather of Mattathias. The Hasmoneans ruled the Jewish nation for the next 100 years. But in February 135 BC, Simon and two of his sons, Mattathias and Judah, were assassinated at a banquet hosted by his son-in-law, who happened to be the Seleucid governor of Jericho. The spiritual legacy of the Maccabean family among the Jews is perhaps most succinctly stated in the apocryphal book of 1 Maccabees, where it is written that Jonathan endeavored to rid the ungodly from Israel. 1 Maccabees 9, verse 73. And this is in accord with verse 35 in this vision. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure. Notice, however, that the vision still looks ahead to the end time because it is still to come at the appointed time. We noted at the very beginning of our study of this vision that the terminal point of events it prophesies is the time when they finish shattering the power of the holy people. Chapter 12 and verse 7. That means that despite the successes of the Maccabean Rebellion, establishing the quasi-independent Asmonean kingdom, the Jewish commonwealth still had a date with destiny. In the final lesson on the vision of the exalted men, we will learn what that destiny was and how it came about. You will pray.